Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads TV. My name is Arya Cohen Wade, and I'm your host today. And my guest is Milton Lawson. Uh, Milton, could you introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Milton Lawson, a comic book writer in Houston, Texas, and actually also former uh, webmaster at Blogging Head several years ago. Yeah, so you're uh, a former Blogging Head's employee, that's how we know each other, um, since moved on to, to Better and Brighter Things. Um, we, we did an episode a couple years ago uh, that people might want to check out where we talked about um, your work in comics and other comics things that I can't remember. I think it was like 2015, so it's probably kind of old. Um, but the, yeah. t- the, the topic for today... Um, is Avengers Endgame, um, which came, came out over the weekend and like shattered every box office record and it's gonna be the, uh, you know, biggest, uh, blockbuster in human history or whatever. Um, and we both saw it. So we're, we're gonna discuss it. Uh, we're gonna briefly discuss it in a spoiler free, um, zone <laughs> and then we will quickly thereafter move to, a uh, spoiler-filled free-for-all and talk about the movie. And, uh, yeah, if you... So if you um, are considering whether or not to see this movie... I mean, you probably have made up your mind already, but uh, if you're still uncertain, uh, we'll talk talk about that. We'll talk about whether or not people should go see it uh, in the first section, and then after that, it'll pretty much just be for people who either don't care about spoilers or who saw the movie. Okay. So, Milton, what did you think of Avengers Endgame? Well, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly in the tank for the Marvel movies, especially the Marvel movie, movies that have been done by Marvel Studios. I'm a longtime comics fan since the late 1970s, and Marvel was my uh, preferred uh, venue of uh, the, between the two big uh, publishers. I, I preferred Marvel. Marvel. And DC, yeah. I'm actually, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wearing the only comic book shirt I have, which is my uh, <laughs> Bat Cat shirt. Um, but that's a little off brand because yeah, we're talking about the Marvel universe and the Marvel cinematic universe, not the DC universe. Yeah. But I, that concession aside, I I, I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was an amazing culmination of uh, 21 or 22 films that led up to it It is a very satisfying conclusion, not just to a number of storylines and a number of character arcs, but also a, you know, a back half of what is essentially a two part movie, uh, beginning with uh, Infinity War, um, I was I was definitely uh, uh, cheering and and ho- hooting and hollering <laughs> in in some of the the key uh, key most uh, exciting moments. So uh, ten out of ten is what I put on my my Twitter account right when I walked out of the theater. So uh, and you, I, you, I, I did you see it? At, did you see it at midnight um, opening I night? Saw, or you, you saw it very soon after opening. Very soon, uh, Thursday night. There was there was Wednesday screenings that you could get into if you bought the like eight hour long marathon thing or whatever. And I just didn't feel up to that as much as I love those films. <laughs> so I went the next day on Thursday, and um, as as many people experienced when ticket sales went online, the official phone apps for most of the places where you could buy tickets were were crashing, and I couldn't get into the first screening. So I. I went 10 p.m. that night. Cool. Um, yeah, so I saw it. I, I did not feel like I needed to be there <laughs> as soon as it opened, but um, I did. I saw it Saturday, I guess, and at my local theater, it was playing every half hour, so I must have had it on four or five screens. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I pretty much just was like left the house and like, okay, I'll just see whatever the next one was. Um, so I I liked it. I'm still kind of thinking about it. I think it's a very impressive accomplishment for like both this specific movie and the entire, you know, 21 or 22 movie cycle that they, that they created. It's, it's really something that has never been done before in film. It's more like something that, you know, not, not in comparison to qual- to in quality, but like, you know, these, um, like Balzac's, you know, like dozens of novels, uh, about interlocking characters and stuff like that are, you know, I'm trying, like what, like, you know, some of Philip Roth's novels have the same character appearing, um, in multiple ones and they came out decades apart. Um, so I liked it. I actually think I liked, um, the previous one, uh, Infinity War better. And yeah, this is really, um, 
it really is more like one movie, one five and a half or whatever hour movie uh, split into two parts. And I think I liked the previous one a little bit better. Um, but there were things I things I really enjoyed about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you saw the if you saw Infinity War, you know it ended on a big cliffhanger, and you might as well go see this to see how they you know figure out how to like re, you know reboot the plot and. Uh, do the things they need to do for this to be a continuing like economic <laughs> enterprise. Um, but I guess I, I gave it like if just as a movie, it's like kind of a B plus for me. Um, but as a you know just corporate enterprise of creativity and the labor of like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to like digitally animate all these characters and do all these other ridiculous things to bring the characters that yeah I was so just. I was a comic book fan growing up really in the early to mid 90s was my comic book years. And, you know, it, I never could have dreamed back then that, like, you would actually see these characters doing things in a way that looked realistic. So, like, that's a dream come true for the little comic book nerd that's inside me. But, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Um, so, okay, before we, is there anything else you want to say before we move to a spoiler filled. Um, discussion of of the movie uh no i don't believe so i i think uh your reference to the thousands of people that were involved did you by any chance stay for the full credits just to see the magnitude of of that craft of people you know i i so it's funny because you know they started this thing where at the end of the the post credits sequence i think i think that was in the first iron man movie they did that so then it became like you had to stay and see what it was. And then I saw online that they, there wasn't one for this, which makes sense because they're kind of ending it. And also I really did have to use the bathroom. So (laughs) I was like, I'm not waiting around just to stare at the black screen for 10 more minutes. I'm going to go to the bathroom. And, and that was it for me. Um, So, but yeah, if you, yeah, just like, you know, all it's crazy how, how like many people work on these things and all the labor uh, that goes into it. I was, I was uh, chatting with a friend of mine who's a video game developer who was saw the movie with me, and he knows uh, he knows computer graphics extremely well. And we were just commenting on the fact that as the as the credits rolled, it, it seems like every major visual effects house had a sequence or something they did. So the credits were just staggering. Yeah, and they you know they they I, they filmed the two movies uh, together. But like churning, churning it out, you know, churning it out five and a half hours in the span of, you know, two years or something is is also very impressive. Um, yeah. So okay, so why don't we move to the spoiler spoiler filled section? Um, <laughs> right. So when okay, so when I'm sure as a educated comic book person, when you saw the end of um, Infinity War, when half of humanity and uh, superhero humanity, uh, you know, turn into dust. I'm sure you were thinking, well, they're going to come back because that's the whole thing. The comic books is the characters never die. They always come back. Um, sure. It was, there was one caveat to that too, for me, um, as a somewhat older comic fan, having gone through adaptations, uh, of lesser, uh, fidelity to the original source material, me and a lot of my comic book geek friends were actually stunned that they went all the way with the snap. We just figured they would allude to it some way, but wouldn't go all the way. So I was too stunned to actually form that thought. <laughs> uh, that came sort of later in the auditorium. Yeah, it was. So it was, it was shocking when they did it. And when, and the, you know, the, the, the graphic effect is like incredible um, and very beautiful. Um, and yeah, when you, and then you're like, Wait a second. <laughs> you know, we all know that the, the Black Panther movie made a billion dollars and everyone right. loved it. And so Black Panther is not going to turn to dust because like they're already making Black Panther 2. So they have to uh, come through this. So there's like the comic book thing of, you know, every single character who dies in the comic book more or less eventually comes back to life. Um, and, Multiple times. <laughs> yes. And and then, so that's kind of unique to the to comic books. But then there's just like, yeah, they're making a lot of money on this stuff. And, <laughs> you know, we already know there's this, another Spider-Man movie coming out next year. So Spider-Man has to come back and Black Panther has to come back, et cetera, et cetera. It's still like 
shocking to see it. And I guess in one of the um, the Slate Culture Gab Fest or Slate um, spoiler special that I listened to, I think it was Jamel Bowie um, was saying that his mom doesn't know anything about comic books, but likes these movies. And mm-hmm. like after she saw it, sh- saw um, Infinity War, she called him up like almost hysterical, being like, "They killed Black Panther! <laughs> what, what, what are they going to do? They killed Black Panther!" Uh, so okay, so that, there's that. Okay, but then we we come back and yes. Uh, so it's kind of like, I, I guess the, 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 the first really surprising thing that happened was when they go find, um, Thanos. And yes. Would you agree with, agree with that? Like that was oh, yes, maybe that... really the only truly surprising thing in the movie from my perspective is they go find Thanos to get the ring, to get the stones on the Infinity Gauntlet, which viewers can see is behind you <laughs> right now. Um, and, and the, and they're gone. Um, he's, he's used the stones to, to destroy the stones and he's kind of, um, uh, his body is a wreck. Like he's weakened by having to use the stones, which sets up this idea that doing a snap is very dangerous for the person who does it. And you need to be super strong in order to do it. And so the stones are gone and they're kind of talking to him and and then Thor just comes out and chops his head off. And I was like slack at that point because I, I, I yeah. couldn't believe that because um, I don't think that happened in the comic books. <laughs> um, and right. so that was like a really interesting narrative choice that 20 minutes in the guy who we're thinking is the ultimate villain in the universe gets taken out. And then it's like, right. what, what happens next? Um, yeah. So what, what did you think, think about that part? I, I completely agree that that I did not see that coming. Um, in, in the promotional run-up materials that led to it, Robert Downey Jr. In, uh, was very confident in saying, you guys are not going to be able to predict how the second half goes. And, and I, I believe they delivered on that on multiple fronts. And um, the audience I was with, right after the moment where Thor beheads Thanos, there's a title card that comes up and says five years later, but it does it in this very uh, strong pause filled five years <laughs> later. And there were audible gasps. Yeah. In same my, in my, there were people screen. gasping in my theater. Yeah. That's, that's like the second narrative too. They do. And actually I just say we, um, we, we skipped over the very opening of the movie, which is this scene with Hawkeye. Um, and it, mm-hmm. what happened, what happened, you know, Hawkeye wasn't in the previous movie at all. And it, it, he's shown uh, just having a good time with his family somewhere in rural America and teaching his daughter how to, uh, you know, do the bow and arrow. And then um, she disappears and the rest of the family disappears. And, uh, yeah, so that, you know, that was a very effective, like, opening. And you can see more of how this, you know, this crazy idea played out with yes. with normal people. Uh, so that was effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. As as many people have uh, not originally uh, said, and I'll repeat it here, that scene and much of the first third of the movie is very reminiscent of the HBO series The Leftovers, and and that that was the purest leftover scene in in the whole uh, the whole you know initial opening act. Yeah, I yeah I've um yeah I saw that comparison as well, and I even though I haven't seen the leftovers, I thought of that because I know the plot of the leftovers, and it, it almost like made me want to watch the leftovers um, because it, <laughs> it is an interesting idea. And so when they jump ahead five years, like this this section of the film is is unusual for a superhero film because it's basically about uh, grief and people dealing with their yeah. grief, and we see a support group that Captain America is at. Um, where he's trying to help people who, you know, talking to someone who like went on his first date since mm. the snap. And and even, even Captain himself is not much of a draw. Everybody is so down in the dumps. Being able to be in a support group with Captain America is not enough to get enough people there. There's like six people or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, yeah, it's like the whole world is depressed, it seems like. And yeah, and so Captain America is in p- plain clothes, and but everyone knows who he is. He's Steve Rogers. Everyone knows, and um, yeah, no one's looking. Oh. No one's that excited about it. Um, and you know, I, so it's 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 interesting that they, you know, decided to have this long stretch without any action or super heroics. Um, yeah, and they 
they manifest the grief kind of not necessarily the grief but the status of 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 all of this i think very well with um the special effect on robert downey jr's body where he's just totally emaciated from the the time he was just sort of uh floating in space without anywhere to go um so it makes sense you know on a plot sense but it also just sort of visually the effect was really well done he just it looked like the dude went on a Robert De Niro esque, you know, body transformation. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, that too. I was noticing. I was like, is this CGI or is it real? It looked a lot better than when they did the thing in the first Captain America movie where they stuck his head on this scrawny guy's <laughs> body. That one did not work so well in like 2012 or whenever that movie came out. Right. This one, the, the technology has advanced that it looked better. Yes. Yeah. So everyone, everyone is down in the dumps, um, and it's. And you see these, these kind of, they don't, you know, they don't super explore like what happened with this world. Like it's not like right. post-apocalyptic. Um, but you see these shots. It's very like this kind of striking shot of all these like abandoned boats that w- are like trapped at the base of, mm-hmm. of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and outside the uh, city field, the Mets, where the Mets play, you see all these like cars that were, you know, abandoned. Um, so it's this kind of like semi, you know, it's a little bit like a zombie sense to it, but it's just like, yeah, it, it, they never super go into it. I guess you like a lot of fan fiction being written about like what's happening during this, this particular era. It would be interesting to see like some other kind of, I don't know if you, you probably never make a movie about what is happening during this time, but maybe like a novel or a graphic novel about um, how, how people are dealing with this, this idea that half of, half of everyone goes away. And so, yeah, so Cap is like you know helping with grief counseling, and I guess like it, it's implied that um, Black Widow Natasha is like hasn't maybe left the Avengers compound in a long time, and, right? And she has creative. You know, they all have like different hairstyles <laughs> since five years have passed, <laughs> and then so then I guess the is the next thing happens is that Ant Man returns. Yeah, right. Okay, so I, I have you an advantage here. I must uh, also confess I have already seen it twice. Okay, so I, I should have at least. <laughs> Maybe a you should bit be narrating the plot then. Um, so, but just okay. So it, it is you know the, at the post credit sequence at Ant Man and Wasp. Ant Man is stuck in the quantum realm because um, the uh, people who are supposed to take him out, um, the Wasp and the original Ant Man, uh, got uh, snapped away. So they're gone. So then Scott Scott Lang, uh, played by Paul Rudd, who's really the most like comic relief character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, I guess mm-hmm. De- Deadpool is like somewhat out- is like outside that universe. He's kind of a totally comic character, but Ant-Man is kind of the comic relief. And so it is interesting that he, they decided to use him as a thing that kind of jumpstarts the plot of what's going to happen um, because mm-hmm. he's this guy who doesn't really want to be a hero. And he's, yeah, he's, he's more comic than dramatic. Um, <laughs> but then like his reappearance, um, is is key and then actually the the moment that i found most moving in the movie is the one where he goes to his old house and uh finds his Mm -hmm. daughter who has now um you know is now five years older and thought right that he had been snapped away when really he was in the quantum realm um and that that, that, delivers that performance moment just exceptionally well yeah so that that moment i was was remarkable of them of them embracing. And then also the, the moment where he goes to the um, memorial for the people mm-hmm. uh, who are snapped away and seeing these like endless rows of, uh, of names. And it's like, you know, reminiscent of uh, the nine 11 more memorial or the uh, Vietnam war memorial. Uh, but just, yeah, that, that also like reinforces what, um, you know, what the, like the loss that society has, has had to deal with and it was, yeah, it was presented in, in a realistic way, but okay. So then, um, so, so Ant-Man presents like how to, how to solve this thing. And the answer is time travel. And, um, and that's where I was like a little bit like, I kind of thought time travel would have to be involved somehow, um, to get back the people who were snapped away. But that, but like once time travel is introduced, it's, it's like, there's plot confusion and also it's kind of a <laughs> cheap trick in my, in my opinion. So what, what did you think about the time travel aspect of it? 
Well, I I respect that a number of people have a major problem with this and consider it a, a cheat. And I I can sometimes have some sympathy with that view, but I'm just a sucker for the ideas and concepts and questions that come in when you introduce time travel. Uh, I'm a big Doctor Who fan, big Back to the Future fan. Um, to, which, so. which is insult, insulted directly in the movie. There's a... <laughs> That, that yeah, was the fun. Yeah. I thought that had me laughing the hardest in the in the film is where they're like, whatever. Yeah, you know, back to future lied to us or. I I think the that the way that they created their own rule set and decided to not take like the back to the future logic where history can be rewritten, but rather an opportunity to um, steal things and. Um, enhance your options in the in your current time frame is sort of a an interesting uh, way to avoid the 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 sense that what you're doing is a shortcut mm-hmm. because they still have uh, a, an enormous quest in front of their hands to to even enable the the, the time travel stuff and then when they do that the they're their options are finite because the fuel they use is finite. Right. And um, and then, of course, we, as we'll get to later, there's other complexities that come in. So I, I, I hear you on, on – I, I didn't like that choice either at, at the very instant it was proposed. But as, as it developed and went further along, I, th- I thought they executed it pretty much uh, uh, the best they could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it's um, you know it's it's like any t- any plot with time travel in it kind of doesn't make sense if you think about it too much, or, or at least you you can't get a firm handle on it. But right. yeah, the fact that they they kind of wink at us by by mentioning all these time travel movies and saying that they were inaccurate um, is kind of like okay, we're you know we're, we're uh, we we know this is a little ridiculous. And actually, I just realized this: the fact that they go back to the first Avengers movie, the time of the first Avengers movie is ta- is like taken from Back to the Future Two when they go back to Back to the Future One. Um, so I don't know. So I don't know if Back to the Future One is the first time that was ever done. It probably was. Um, how many like sequels to time travel movies were there before that? Uh, and that was always when I was a kid. That was one of my favorite parts of Back to the Future Two. And then it, it's yeah. just cute to see like I think like either the the exact like either recreate the shot or use the exact shot of like when the camera's swirling around the Avengers for the first time to say Avengers Assemble. And then just to see these other, you know, them kind of sneaking around and um, and doing <laughs> doing other assorted hijinks. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess it, it also thematically ties in though because they they chose, you know, they approached this as a as not the final Marvel movie ever, obviously, but they did. R- choose to approach it as a wrap up of a number of very big things that they'd established. And in going back to their own past, they did it literally with moments in the film, but also the, a number of the characters get to uh, confront where they came from, uh, their their origins, their their parentage, their lineage, mm-hmm. and uh, I think time travel folds nicely into that. Yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, this is the final Avengers movie. They went back to the first Avengers movie, um, and there's other kind of touchstones, um, like you see the original Ant Man helmet when they go back um, and are at the you know secret military installation and and, and stuff like that. Um, so actually, so that it makes me think. So when they're in that part, um, uh, Hulk goes and meets the Tilda Swinton character, whose name I can't remember, the Ultimate Master or something. Um, and, I'm drawing a blank. I can't remember uh, who she was either. I mean, she she would be the Sorcerer Supreme of that time, right? Uh, um, yeah. So and she like gives him a uh, super punch and knocks the Hulk out of him. So that that's the only time you really see. Um, Mark Ruffalo in the actual flesh in the movie, but they did they did something interesting because the the classic Hulk is the Jekyll and Hyde character of he's a normal guy and then he gets angry and he becomes super strong and out of control and then um, as that progressed in the comics and when I was reading Hulk comics 
um, in like the nineties, they had like smart Hulk, uh, who yeah. had merged the banner and Hulk personas in, so that he's still super strong and giant and green, but he is not like rage filled and ch- you know, a ch- with like a childlike brain. So they, it's interesting that they brought that, um, and that they decided, you know, that it was worth having like a CGI character be, be you know, be that guy for almost the entire movie. And, you know, famously there, there, well, maybe not famously because the movies didn't do very well, but there are two previous Hulk movies, um, neither of which stars Mark Ruffalo. There was the like late nineties or 2001 that Ang Lee directed. And then there was one that is part of this cycle, but they had, well, God, what was his name? The guy from Ed um, Norton. Yeah. Ed Norton plays Banner. And then I guess he didn't want to do like the press tour or he didn't want to participate more than that. And so they got Ruffalo, but it's also, but also like, I think actually that the the Norton one is the only is the only movie in this whole sequence that I, I haven't actually seen because it, it got bad reviews and I, I didn't really care that much at the time. Um, so yeah, so it's a so it, it like I don't think they've announced any Hulk movies or something, but they have they have like you know they could do it. They just need Ruffalo in the studio to record the um, record the dialogue, and then they could get the CGI uh, monster in there. So that's just interesting to think about and. I don't know why. Like, why exactly did they? Want and to this? there's also there's also actually a legal component to all of this. Apparently, Hulk standalone movies at the time were still somewhat under the domain of another studio, mm-hmm. uh, so they could only use him in team oriented stories or when, oh, when he's appearing okay. with other characters. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I think that worked out well, um, but. Uh, now that now that Disney owns everything, um, <laughs> I believe uh, they can they can do what they want going forward. Yeah, the, I I'm sure someone has written about like just the intellectual property um, side of all these things, and it's super complicated because Marvel tr- you know tried and failed to make movies for a number of years and signed away rights for for various characters and like some of them like there's a Hulk TV show. I don't think did they ever make a movie out of the Lou Ferrigno Hulk. I don't they know made they a handful of sequel uh, made-for-TV movies, but not not a legit theatrical release movie. Right, and then there was like you know Spider-Man cartoon in the sixties and stuff. So uh, yeah, and the rights were all were all a mess, and it, like so that's that's like a weird like legal <laughs> kind of. I'm sure someone could write an article about like the legal adventures of getting like the rights back and everything. Um, okay, so then what's I mean? So another thing that's interesting about this kind of section of the movie is like. Uh, there's no there's no villain because they killed Thanos and it's not like they fight anyone else so it's it's kind of like it is relatively action free and also it's I mean they they like are on a mission um, and so they have this task they want to do of getting the stones so they can bring back all their friends but yeah there's Thanos current <laughs> current Thanos is dead and then but then eventually they encounter past Thanos um, to to be like the the big bad villain once again. But yeah, it is. So I don't know. It, it is, it's more like that, you know, they have these little like side quest kind of things they need to yeah. do. Yeah. Without, and, well, without there the is a villain. sense of palpable, palpable danger in each one of those quests though, because first of all, they've got to have a 100 batting average to hit them all. If they don't, if they don't hit them all. The whole plan is destroyed. Half of all existence uh, continues to be wiped out. Right. And, the, it, they really don't have much of a solid plan other than, you know, we're going to go to these places. We don't, and when we get there, we'll we'll improvise and make it happen. So there's definitely, even without the, the villain there, there's still tension. Right. Um, that yeah, that's true. And so one, and then they they there's a lot of you know there's a crazy amount of cameos in this movie, yes. and they bring back um, virtually everyone who appeared in any of the um, Marvel Cinematic Universe films. And so they go back to the time of um, the second Thor movie, which is, I think, one of the worst uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. But Rene Russo uh, is, comes back, and they, and they even seem to bring back Natalie Portman, although, correct me if I'm wrong, she yes. doesn't actually say anything? I think you're right. I don't think she... Um, wait a minute. She might have had one small line that you don't see her say... I almost um, was, yeah, I was wondering, like, yeah. if they, you know, they could only green screen her in or something, or if she was, like, a totally <laughs> CGI creation, because she's sleeping or something. She's obviously a big star, but, yeah, she was in the two first two Thor movies, and then 
uh, kind of left without being really discussed anymore. But it was interesting that they decided yeah. to try to bring some, like, not exactly closure to that role, but they, they had her there and were talking about her. Um, and then, so then the third one is, so that was, so Thor and Rocket Raccoon are, um, you know, doing that, that mission. And then the third mission is to, like, the planets, like, what, they're like Morgoth or something, and do you remember the other one? If It might not actually be Morgoth. Vormir. Vormir. So, yeah, so one of them is the place where, um, where, like, Thanos is hanging out, uh, with his two daughters, uh, one of whom is Gamora, who died in the previous one, and the other one is Nebula, is that the character's name? Yes. And so, yeah, so then there's some, there's, there's the, one weird thing was they just create this idea that, like, because there's two nebulas there at the same time that, like, their brains are linked or something. Yeah, and so, their, their Wi-Fi, their Wi-Fi password is co- connecting and they're right. like, what the heck, man, what the right. heck. And so that's how, um, uh, you know, 2014 Thanos or whatever learns about what's going on. And then, um, uh, Scarlet, uh, not Scarlet Witch, um, Black Widow and, um, and Hawkeye go to, uh, the place where to get the, the soul stone, you need to sacrifice something you love or just someone needs to sacrifice something in order to, um, get, get the stone. And, and so that's where, um, and so they battle and that's where, uh, uh, the Scarlett Johansson character, uh, Black Widow, uh, falls to her death. Um, which was kind of surprising to me because, um, well, I mean, okay, so it's kind of like, okay, obviously Scarlett Johansson is a bigger star than whatever the guy, the name of the guy who plays Hawkeye, which is eluding me right now. Um, and also it was announced that they want to make a Scarlett, uh, or a, <laughs> a Scarlett Johansson Black Widow <laughs> movie. Um, yes. And that was, I think, announced after Wonder Woman was such a runaway success. It was like, okay, who's our most, Marvel's like, who's our most prominent female character? Let's make a Black Widow movie. Um, but she's the one who dies. And so yes. that was kind of surprising to me. Um, and yeah, just because Scarlett Johansson is a big star, but also, well, maybe she wants out of her contract, but we know she's uh, going to be making this other movie. Uh, and I guess they wanted to keep Hawkeye around so he could have a reunion with his family. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. I was, even though I, I kind of liked, I like Scarlett Johansson and I like her portrayal. I was not particularly moved by, by this for whatever reason. What, how did you feel about when, when she plummeted to her demise? Well, I, I, I was kind of impacted by it because first of all, I, I, I thought they did a, a pretty clever thing with playing with your expectations multiple times and working through an action sequence to where you can't really tell who it is that's going to sacrifice themselves. Right. But, at, her, at least I first thought they were battling because neither wanted to sacrifice themselves, but it's not their battle because they both want to sa- – they're such heroes that they both want to sacrifice themselves. <laughs> Ever the pessimist you are, are you? Okay. <laughs> I mean if I was there with Hawkeye, I'd just be like, Hawkeye, I mean, <laughs> if, you want to go, if you want to go for it. But uh, just uh, if, if nothing other than pure screen time – I believe we all have, or most of us have more of a connection to Black Widow as a character, and therefore her death means more mm-hmm. as an audience. And um, I too was surprised because I was still confused over whether the pending Black Widow movie was going to be after these events or a prequel. And apparently, it's going to be a prequel um, because they they were pretty adamant about setting up the rules that this death counts. Um, cannot be undone even with the the mighty infinity gauntlet right yeah it's, it's yeah so then there's you know they're they're trying to like do this thing so that they can kind of like they go back in time so they can kind of like undo something that seemingly was permanently done um but yeah so that which leads to the question okay why can't you just go back a couple more years and drag the you know natasha of 2012 to 2019 and then like maybe she'll be a little confused but like everyone will be happy uh, why can't you do that i don't know like it, would that violate the rules of time travel unclear because you know like they bring thor's hammer back thor's hammer was had been destroyed but they bring it back does that mean that like 2013 thor didn't have his hammer anymore like i don't know <laughs> i don't know but they're just like yeah she, she's she's gone and um 
Yeah, and I, I mean, she was the, you know, she was the Avenger with, like, who was the most, like, human. She, like, Hawkeye has this ridiculous Bowman skill that's it, that's not, like, supernatural, <laughs> but it's, you know, like, couldn't be replicated on Earth, whereas she's just, like, a really good fighter and acrobat gymnast kind of person. Yeah. So, um. I believe the story mechanics of how they're justifying it is that when someone, uh, dies in that manner, they literally get sucked into the Soul Stone. And therefore, they're not hmm. they're not accessible to the to the energies of bringing them back or whatever. Yeah, that I mean that, that doesn't that doesn't really make sense. But like, okay, that's right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, as as you know, there um there was a long standing thing at Marvel Comics called the No Prize, um, which yes. is when you could identify a factual or logical error in one of the comics and then uh, give a reason to explain why it actually wasn't an error. Then they would uh, send you No Prize. But then, but then yes. after some length of time, they would send you a um, blank envelope that uh, that said like no prize on it, but had, but had or yes. an envelope that said no prize, but had nothing inside. Um, so yeah, so there's a long tradition of like the comic writers and artists screwing up, and then the fans come up with an explanation for it and like help them out. So yeah, so sure, why not? So okay, so what? So is okay. So then they all they all come back and seemingly. So they have all the yeah they they've got all the stones. Well, do, do you want to talk about any more of the time travel things? I guess the the other one is when they go back to that military installation and um, Tony gets to meet his father, uh, played yes. by John Slattery of Mad Men fame, um, which was I don't know it was somewhere between like it was a little heartfelt it was a little corny I thought they made it last a little too long, <laughs> um, but sure I don't know it, it's kind of like you know it's the it's like the moment for Field of Dreams when. Um, yeah, you know the the adult son gets to um, be reunited with the um, long lost father, uh, so that was okay. Um, but it was, um, but and you also see uh, in that scene um, Captain America um, seeing the woman who was his love interest in the first Captain America movie. Yes, yes, um, who was a British secret agent. And whose name I can't remember, but she had like a spinoff TV show that only lasted a season or something. Um, right, right. So Agent Carter, Agent Carter, right. So, yes. um, she... and both of those encounters, I, I think we could revisit. Their utility comes very evident at the conclusion of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, definitely the Captain America, you know, seeing uh, Agent Agent Carter, and and that's the woman who. Uh, whose uh, photo he carries around in like that little um, what you call it uh, that little yeah. compass um, that he that he carries. So then they um, so then they they teleport back uh, through the quantum realm or whatever. But uh, but the Nebula has been switched, and um, and so evil Nebula from the past is um, is is there and starts you know pulling pulling a trick. And um, just a side note, I don't know why, you know, like, the, the woman they cast, uh, who was in Doctor Who, right? Karen Gillian yes. or something? Like, I don't know why they cast this beautiful woman to be um, slathered <laughs> in, in purple and blue makeup and, like, speak lines in this very robotic way. I don't, didn't make a ton yeah. of sense to me. Um, but anyway, she is, so she, like, secretly teleports the um, Thanos and his ship and stuff to... From 2014 to 2019, is that right? Yes. And I, I was pleased. I mean, I'm not necessarily a, a strict uh, believer of, of uh, adherence to source material. I'm all in favor of going in new directions. But it was good that they gave that character in particular uh, a little bit more to do um, because in the source material, she's absolutely crucial to the outcome of that version of of the whole Thanos Infinity Gauntlet storyline, the original one. Yeah, I'm actually that's one of the few characters I wasn't familiar with, and uh, I, maybe they didn't. That character wasn't around much in the '90s when I was reading comics. Um, and but yeah, well, so what is the what, how does that how does it, so how does it play out? Because there's like Infinity War is like a big was a big Marvel crossover series in the 1980s comics with you know kind of that's the the inspiration for these movies how, how does it how does the plot play out in uh in the comics? there's there's a number of there are a number of significant differences um and just in terms of a a movie 
experience. I believe they they made uh, great choices in all of the changes they did. Like, first of all, Thanos' entire motivation in the comics is not about this ideology right. of of uh, balance of life in the universe and 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 creating a situation for people to thrive. It's that's a part of it, but he's mainly just trying to impress a woman. Right. It's about um, a crush. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty yeah, silly. Yeah, it's about a crush. Um, he, has a, he has a crush it's, it's, on the embodiment of death, who's a woman. Right. And so, yeah, he yeah. wants to impress her by doing this, by killing all yeah. these people. And the, um, the embodiment of death in, in the story is portrayed um, both as a skeleton, like a classic death figure, but also as a beautiful woman. So there's there's that. And I don't quite think that would work as well uh, in in a modern movie. Um, so I thought that was really cool. And there's there's a character in uh, these stories called Adam Warlock, who most people don't know, and he's sort of the 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 key superhero that does all of the key things to uh, uh, fight Thanos. But um, I. Personally, uh, I know one of my friends is going to kill me for saying this, but I'm not <laughs> not that big of a fan of that character, so I'm glad that they didn't didn't use him. Uh, in no, he has context. he has an Infinity Stone in his forehead in the comics, right? Oh gosh, I can't remember. I don't. He may have at one point, but he definitely has a starburst on his head. But yeah. I don't. I don't. Know if that's where he began. Um, but um, and then another very significant difference is just in the. Um, Original stories, Nebula actually uh, managed to snatch the Infinity Gauntlet herself. And so Thanos kind of goes off to the side for a while, and Nebula uh, is the wielder of all bad things. Hmm. Uh, so so that's, that's why I, I was just commenting on it – was, it was good to see her have a crucial role, even though it was not anything like what it was in the original stories. Yeah, and they um... – so did they – was she hooked up with the Guardians of the Galaxy in the comics as well? This was kind of even prior to the existence of what we think of as the Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um, all of those characters still existed kind of on their own, but it wasn't until the mid-2000s or so there was this series called Annihilation that really brought those characters together and referred to them as Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't remember. Some of those guys might have been involved, but I don't think so. I think it was more of the traditional, uh, the traditional Marvel grounded characters. Mm-hmm. Now, so here's a somewhat separate question. So when I was a comic book fan, it was like around the time that the uh, X Men the animated series came out, and then like the X Men movie came out towards the end of my comic book fandom, and it was also like the beginning of internet uh, fan cultures. And so, like, if there was something in X Men the animated series that was adapted directly from the comics, but they changed it or they got it wrong. Like the fans were all pissed off. <laughs> and yeah. They were like, Oh, they ruined it. Um, is that, but like things have, I feel like things have matured somewhat, but, and these things are now just, it's not just like a Saturday morning cartoon. It's like the biggest, uh, you know, grossing movie of all time. So are the fans yeah. generally on board with like, let's just let them do whatever they want to do. Or are they still like, well, actually, if you read Uncanny X-Men number 173, then you would know that, blah, blah, blah. My perception is that it's gone in a very healthy direction, and essentially the key uh, fulcrum that twists the opinion is just whether or not it's good. If if they totally change something, but it turns out to work, they're on board with it. They're fine. Um, there are, of course, some hardcore fans who, who clutch to every single detail uh, mercilessly, mm-hmm. but... Um, the the better the the adaptation works on its own merits, the 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 more latitude most fans tend to give them. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that's a good sign for uh, for the health of, of comic fan community. Um, at least that aspect of it. Okay, so then, so this is okay. So that's the moment where they they finally have all the stones and um and they decide that the Hulk is gonna. Um, put it on and un- and do his own snap. It's a, lo- it's a little unclear why you have to snap, um, <laughs> but they, they... yes, apparently that's that's the gesture that you know Cosmic Steve Jobs programmed into the Gauntlet software. Yeah, it, yeah, you gotta, you can't. It's not like you know some other. <laughs> it's not like making a, you know, it's not like making a fist or like doing peace <laughs> sign or something. You have to do the snap, and so he does the snap, and um, and. 
I guess at first, uh, then you're not really quite sure whether it, ha- it worked or not. But then, like, right. immediately after the whole th- like the whole Avengers compound explodes because Thanos and his evil army are there, um, and then there's yeah. So uh, so then there's like the so then okay at this point I thought well okay here they're gonna kill off some characters because like they just got hit with a bunch of intergalactic missiles and the right. thing you know they all they all fell you know, down a giant hole or something and water's rushing by and people could drown, et cetera, et cetera. But they didn't, they didn't do that. Um, uh, you know, they kind of just, that was just kind of like some, I guess some distraction before the big battle. Um, but then, yeah, but then, and then it like lines it up for the big battle. Are we, am I forgetting anything before we're ready for the big showdown? No, no. Um, I, I do think in, in the earliest portions of the discussion, you, um, you jumped over two details that I think are kind of worth uh, savoring. First okay. of all, and it, it, this kind of is kind of crucial to what happens. Um, Tony Stark in, in the five year time period fathers a child with uh, Pepper Potts. Mm-hmm. And therefore he has an enormous stake in retaining the five years uh, of misery that everyone else suffered because he has, he has a daughter now, and he he cannot uh, go back to the world before that because he d- he doesn't want to sacrifice her. Right. Okay. So you can't just yeah you can't just send us all back to this other time and with no Thanos or something. Yeah. Like, right. Life right. has gone that, on. Yeah. Um. And uh, it's it's pretty amazing because essentially I think Bruce Banner is just uh, adhering to that request. He's got the gauntlet. I'm assuming he could ignore that request if he wanted to, mm-hmm. um, but uh, he, he went there. And then the other thing that we've neglected to mention is Fat Thor. Oh, right. We've got Good a, point. We've got, a, we've got a portly Thor in the house now, so he's, <laughs> he's sort of there. He's, he's, he's able to bring the thunder, so to speak, but he's also kind of a little bit, you know, not, not at optimum Thor. Yeah, I mean, the way I think the Slate Culture Gap Fest people described him as having, um, like, PTSD – and, yes. Um, yeah. So he kind of is the comic relief in addition to Ant Man. Um, they make explicit comparisons between him and the Big Lebowski. Um, <laughs> you know, they dress him in the sweater like a Big Lebowski wears, and there's and then there's that one shot where he's standing by the ocean um, and he's wearing sunglasses. That is the exact shot where they uh, scattered the, uh, Donnie's ashes at the end of Big Lebowski. <laughs> um, so that was just kind of like surprising that you know they had yes. the character and they had this guy like. Uh, the actor Hemsworth, who looks like you know, looks like a golden god, and then they um, decided to make him, you know, look like a scruffy homelessy guy who has a big gut. Um, yes. did, was that a CGI gut? Do you have an idea, or was that like a prosthetic I, gut? I think it looked. I, I think it was a prosthetic gut, but I'm I'm not I'm not going to stake a claim either way. Right. So he's he's kind of not. Um, I mean, he's the most powerful of the Avengers because he's you know a ailing god. Um, but he's kind of out of commission because he uh, he doesn't have his hammer for a long time, and he uh, yeah is kind of like depressed or uh, decided that he would rather just like play video games and get drunk. And then you get there's a lot of stuff about him being uh, drunk, wanting to drink beer, being convinced to like go on a, on a plane because they have beer there, uh, which yeah. I guess kind of makes sense for the character who's like in. You know, it's supposed to be able to like, like have a voracious appetite. Um, yeah, be able to like eat, you know, like a an entire cow or something like that. So yeah, and you know, his his sort is like Viking mythology, and he's like from mead halls and yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so yeah, what did, I mean? Did you like that? Did you like that they made Thor kind of the comic relief depressed yes, guy? <laughs> very much so because. Um, Writing Thor and Superman and and infinitely powerful characters poses a challenge, and it's 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 great to see when you can do something new and unexpected with them. And Chris has Hemsworth, you know, he has impeccable comic timing, so uh, the ability to let him riff on things uh, is a great choice. Yeah, so what, I mean, it's interesting because, like I said, the, the second Thor movie was one of the worst of the two dozen movies, but the third one, um, they did it in a completely different style with a new director, uh, this guy from New Zealand and basically did it as like a wacko comedy. 
And, yeah. um, and yeah, it showed that Hemsworth, in addition to being uh, a golden god, like is, has great <laughs> comic timing and can be a like legit comic actor. Um, yeah. so yeah, so they were, you know, taking good advantage of that. Um, okay. So are we ready for the big, <laughs> for the big final battle? The $100 million CGI extravaganza. Right. Yeah, so what did you think of it? Well, I had told a number of my friends, um, I, my entire review of the movie was going to, uh, was going to pivot on one detail. <laughs> I had one non-negotiable detail that had to happen in this film. Uh-huh. And that was, thankfully, the creators of the three movies prior to this, had the wisdom and the patience to not utilize the team's immortal catchphrase. But had they <laughs> neglected to not use the catchphrase, I would have stormed out of the theater very angry. However, in the most glorious fashion possible, with the entirety of the good guys returned uh, from their uh, uh, post-snap uh, uh, resurrection, uh, uh, lie it amongst waste. Um, Captain America gets to say the catchphrase. And uh, for those of you who do not know it, <laughs> you should know it. It's Avengers Assemble. And that was the moment in which I erupted <laughs> along with 200 other people. Uh, and uh, that moment alone was, you know, as they say, worth the price of admission for me. <laughs> well, actually, I, the moment that I liked, the, the, the fan service moment that I liked the most and what I thought you were going to say was the moment where Captain America picks up the hammer. Um, yes. Oh, yes. Which they had kind of teased a little bit in the previous ones. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, when he did that, people, I think I cheered and people were cheering in my screening. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a great moment. And, you know, for, <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, this whole mythology about only, like, you know, the worthy man can pick up Thor's hammer. is kind of like Arthur's, you know, pulling the sword out of Arthur's stone. And, yeah. and you know, Cap is presented as, like, the, you know, best, most moral, ethical uh, American possible and uh, to see him pick it up and then uh, battle with it, I thought was really cool. So I, that was one of my favorite moments. Um, you know, when the, uh, when, when they all come back was, was presented in a very cool way. And it was very like, you know, and here's the cast of Black Panther and here's the cast of <laughs> Ant-Man and here's the amazing Spider-Man. And, um, but I was, so yeah. that was cheesy, but I was like down for it. And yeah, and they had so many, like, you know, they had so many, like, big name actors all in this same scene. I assume they weren't actually all there, the, you know, the whole time, and that it was yeah. a lot of, like, CGI cutting and pasting of people. Um, but, you know, as, as, like, as a movie, actually, like, all of these movies have a big action scene at the end. Um, a lot of them involve, like, nameless alien hordes descending right, and. Right battling so there was some of that but a lot of it was also this like we had to keep a hold of the gauntlet and various people holding it um and yeah. it was kind of like they a, literally ran the gauntlet <laughs> right right yeah so it was kind of a, like like tag you're it or capture the flag kind of thing yeah um which was which was kind of cool they just so there was um uh so i like yeah i like that um i liked i liked when captain marvel who we haven't mentioned yet um reappears and takes out the giant spaceship all by herself. That was really cool. Yes. Um, and she's a cool character. I'm looking forward to like more Captain Marvel stuff, uh, in the future. And she, uh, she takes a direct punch to the face, uh, from Thanos at his strongest, uh, and does not flinch. And that was pretty, that was pretty badass. <laughs> right. So they're putting so, so she seems to be like Superman level in terms of, um, her like strength and stuff, but also she like can shoot energy. Um, and then there was there was a moment that was like I, I thought on the line between like uh, cool and like annoying fan service, and that was when all the women like somehow ended up next to each other and lined up and re- got ready to like fight as one. So like people in my people in my theater clapped when that happened, but that was almost over the line <laughs> in terms of like we're gonna just like give you the thing that's gonna make the nerds happy. Um, yeah, did you did you think that was too far? Did you did you like that moment? Uh, I like that moment quite a lot because I, I, I do believe that the uh, uh, the experience of these films and the proliferation of 
a number of heroic female characters has been celebrated by the fan community and uh you know going to conventions these days seeing the uh the cosplayers uh, male and female um just inhabiting all of these characters i i, I think um it, it resonates as as sort of like uh, there are there are parts of the fan community that are going to love that uh, so much, and I, I feel a connection to that even if even if uh, you know uh, some people are not necessarily the biggest fan of. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and actually there was an interview interview that's a pretty good interview that the New York Times did with the two guys who wrote the script uh, that we'll link to. Um, and they mentioned that moment as like they went back and forth over whether to keep that in or cut it as being too like fan servicey or too cheesy, but they decided to keep it in. Um, so okay, so yeah, so the, you know, there's a lot of you know everyone's fighting and they're fighting all the you know the alien space dogs and stuff, and then they uh, and then um, th- yeah, there's a lot of people facing off like against Thanos and Captain America especially, and you think. Um, you know, is Captain America going to be, like, the one who, who does this? But then uh, uh, Thanos, like, destroys his shield, uh, which is supposed to be unbreakable, uh, <laughs> made of vibranium. <Right. laughs> and, um, or perhaps a vibranium adamantium alloy. Um, we'll get the fact check on the fact check on that one later. <laughs> and, yeah, so then it's, so then um, they, well, I, I, how did that, how, remind me exactly how it works. It, it's that they distract him. And especially Captain Marvel distracts him, and then um, it turns out that the, they had taken the. He's wearing the gauntlet, but they take the stones yes. from it. Um, he uh, he gets the gauntlet, and then Captain Marvel uh, manages to take it away from him. I think I may be misremembering the sequence myself here, um, but then uh, he gets it again uh, for a second time, puts it on. Starts getting all energized with the uh, uh, the pre uh, you know warming up phase of the new <laughs> wielder of the gauntlet, whatever that entails, booting up. Um, <laughs> and um, Tony Stark jumps in, Iron Man jumps in and, and grabs a hold of it while he's in that powering up state. And then uh, Thanos push shoves him aside with all of his might and power, like he does. And grabs the gauntlet and snaps again. At which point, a number of us in the audience think, "Oh my goodness, what the heck happened? <laughs> We're down this road again." Right. Um, right. But the, okay. But then it's revealed that uh, the stones are not in the gauntlet. The stones are like embedded in Tony's, you know, cybernetic suit. And yes, yes. Like a good hacker, he left a back door for it for himself. <laughs> Cause the, the gauntlet he is where the Thanos is wearing at that point is something that Tony Stark had constructed. Right. Thanos that's a good point. Yeah. It's not the original gauntlet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he was able to, he was able to add a, a few little modifications under the radar <laughs> that uh, Thanos didn't detect. Right. And so then he, so then Tony snaps, does he actually snap? He must, right? He actually, yes. he actually does a snap. Yes. And then, um, and then all the uh, the villains uh, start uh, fading away into dust, uh, including Thanos, in, a, in a, like a, a fairly long and cool looking death sequence of where he sits down defeated, and then he turns into dust and fades away. Um, but Tony is, uh, you know, it, pre- it was established that it, like you know doing this is like being hit by lightning or something, and um, so the Hulk could do it and Thanos could do it. But they were like they were injured, and then Tony did it, even though he had a suit on. It was too much, and uh, Tony uh, Tony dies. Uh, Pepper Potts is like Lady Iron Man. Um, uh, ha- you know, Tony built a suit for her, so she's involved in the fight, and so she comes in and she's there. Um, and yeah, and then oh no, but but he has a very what does he say? He says before he snaps, he says, "I am Iron Man." Yes, because uh, up until that point, uh, Thanos had. Uh... Uh, offered his own catchphrase, uh, self-glossing himself as "I am inevitable." Right, so, and then that was uh, Stark's retort. Right, I, perfect, I thought he was. Go- Sorry, go ahead. And, and that's just a perfect echo of the final line of the original Iron Man movie, which was the final line of that movie. Right, I had forgot. I had forgotten about that. Um, but yeah, because he goes a press conference and announces that uh, you know Tony Stark 
uh, billionaire inventor is Iron Man. I'm I, when when after uh, Santa said I am in- inevitable, I thought uh, uh, Iron Man was going to say I am invincible because he was the invincible oh. Iron Man. <laughs> but but then like I, I realized that wouldn't make any sense because he was about to die. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I am Iron Man. That's a good line. And then, okay, so then he dies. And then they, um, and then they have this, um, and then they have Tony's funeral. Um, and some, like, I like the comic book trope, by the way. This is, this is something that every comic book fan has, uh, experienced at least 75 times. All the heroes assembling. Moving shot of like all of the heroes, somber and, and somebody missing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, and they have this tracking shot, uh, past like most of the characters, um, you know, the actors are all like, uh, high caliber actors. And I was just thinking, wow, it's incredible that, well, at first I was like, did they really get like 35 different yeah. high level, like A-list actors to stand there to do this? Or did they like CJ them in? But anyway, like a number and even like people who, didn't have another line as far as I know, like Mar- Marissa Tomei, who, p- who plays um, uh, Aunt May to the new mm-hmm. uh, Peter Parker Spider-Man. She's in there. And yeah, just a lot of characters who you hadn't thought about. And they got the actor in there to just <laughs> yeah. wear black and look somber. So yes, yeah. that was, I think, almost like, you know, how incredible is it that they yeah. need this crazy series of movies with all these like, great actors. And, yeah. and like <laughs> and sandwiched it. in, we, we glossed over this earlier. Robert freaking Redford reprised his role too. Right. So, I mean, everybody was in this movie. Yeah. He, after Redford had announced that he was retiring from acting with that last movie <laughs> he made, um, he said that was going to be his last movie, but they left out that he, he was in this for like three minutes. Um, yeah. So it is. And okay. So then there's, some okay, so the, I guess the, really the it's kind of like saying goodbye to our beloved Avengers, and how do they, you know, kind of, um, you know, push them off stage? So they so they already got right. rid of Black Widow, and Iron Man just died, and then they have a scene showing uh, Hawkeye reuniting with his family, which is very nice, and it seems like you know he's probably he's much happier just being a civilian and. Uh, that's his exit, and then um, Thor goes off with the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, in a way that made it seem like he's going to be in Guardians of the Galaxy three, which I'm sure they're making and will be at you know in the next couple of years, and which is you know he has funny comic timing with the other you know the guy who plays Star Lord, the other Chris whose last name I can't remember, um, Pratt. Yeah, right, Chris <laughs> Pratt. So yeah, so maybe that's his you know his ending is. Uh, is that he's just part of that crew now. <laughs> and, and then he leaves, he leaves new Asgard to, um, Tessa Hadley's character, uh, which was kind of funny. Um, but, but nice. And Valkyrie, that's her character. And, yeah. um, and then the, the, and then like the most resonant one to me was the Captain America one. And so, um, am I forgetting anyone besides Captain America? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. So then Captain America is going to go back to put the stones, back in the rightful place in the timeline. I don't know if this really makes sense <laughs> considering everything they told us about like the branching timelines and stuff. Like, does it really matter? But he goes, but, and they're like, you know, take as long as you need, you know, take as long as you need. Hey, T- Tilda Swinton was on board with it. So if she's on board with it. It, it works. Right. Yeah. So she's, she's the sorceress supreme or whatever. And so, um, yeah. And so they, um, they send him back in time, um, but he doesn't come back. And then it turns out, uh, that he just stayed in the past, and uh, they meet him as a uh, old man sitting on the bench there, and they do some actually pretty good, like old person special effects, whether it's CGI or yeah, yeah, I agree. It didn't look fake in the way a lot of these when you try to you know age someone fifty years, it looks fake. So so he's and you know, and also key. Not only does it look fake a lot of times, it usually constricts an actor's ability to emote, but he was able to give it a performance through whatever it is they did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, so that, yeah, that whole sequence is well done. He, um, gives the, he gives a shield to, uh, Falcon. And I guess that's something that happened in the comics at some point that Falcon takes over as Captain America. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they'll give him, um, his own movie or something as Captain America. 
or or well, whether he'll, he'll be in the Avengers know, or what. They well, they announced a number of television programs for their new streaming service, Disney Plus. That's you know supposed to be their competition to Netflix, mm-hmm. and I believe there was like three Marvel projects that were announced. One of which was Sam Wilson and Bucky, and we always assumed that that was Falcon and Bucky, but now we mm. know this is probably a new Captain America TV show. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, actually there's a Hawkeye. So I guess Hawkeye probably isn't retiring to a life in the country because they announced it's some kind of Hawkeye TV show um, on that on that service as well. Um, but yeah, so that was, um, you know, so then it basically is like, and then, so you see that he has a wedding ring on and, and one of them asks him, um, you know, who did you marry? He's like, I'm not gonna tell you. Um, <laughs> but he, yeah, it, I found that to be a very moving part of the movie and they like, didn't have to do that. Um, you know, they could have just sent him off on a secret mission or something. Um, but yeah. just the idea that, you know, he was, he always wanted to just have a regular life and that was denied him because he got stuck, <laughs> you know, frozen underwater for 70 years and that he got to go back and live, um, you know, live as a normal person with the woman he wanted to be with. And the last, um, shot of the movie is him, uh, like, you know, he's in, the, he's in like 1947 and he's dancing with, uh, his wife who is the agent Carter, um, woman, uh, and yeah, so that's like, you know, that's a surprising place to end a giant CGI, um, blockbuster extravaganza to have this just very simple moment. But I, I thought, I thought that was very effective and, um, yeah, and is a good way to say goodbye to Cap without having to kill him or send him to another planet or, or right. something like that. Yeah, very satisfying. End. And I, I was particularly moved, uh, on a number of levels, but, um, that I was struck by the sort of mirror image journey that the Captain America character has gone through these films and the Tony Stark character has. Um, and essentially it, it boils down to the whole simple uh, morality tales that were built into the Marvel Universe from day one, from Stanley and Steve Ditko with the great power and great responsibility thing. And Tony Stark starts out as a character who's entirely selfish, consequences be damned, uh, literally exploding things out and causing mayhem throughout the world. And he, he adopts this, uh, this new philosophy of, of, of a heroic, uh, frame of mind to, uh, to be sacrificed, uh, self-sacrificing. Mm-hmm. And that theme was kind of echoed in, uh, John Slattery's appearance. We were talking about that earlier. John Slattery's character, his father gives him a line about, uh, the balance between, uh, self-interest and the greater good. And he, his father felt that it was a failing of his, that he always felt that he was always siding on the, uh, self-interest side of the equation. Mm-hmm. And then you contrast that with Captain America, who's always been selfless right. from the moment we see him. And his reward at the end is, we allow him to indulge in what seems relatively to him by his code, a little bit of selfishness. And he kind of has an impish smile and he's, it's a well-earned reward for that character. Yeah, that's, that's great. I I like that a lot. Um, Yeah. You, you know, if, if, if Captain America had been the one who sacrificed himself to defeat Thanos, it would have been like, yeah, that makes sense. Like Cap is selfless, selfless and he'll, he always does the right thing. Um, but to have Tony Stark, who starts off being the billionaire playboy character, um, uh, you know, being the one who, who gives up his life against Thanos, uh, yeah, is, is narratively satisfying. Um, okay, so uh, anything else you want to say about the movie specifically? Before, I, I also want to talk about the entire series, just v- you know, very briefly as, as a whole. The only thing I want to say was uh, I was actually oddly moved, and this is a ridiculous thing to admit on on video, but <laughs> I was oddly moved by the um, the closing credit sequence where the the big six cast members, as they're a montage of their heroic moments, and uh, like a statue of them comes into focus. There's 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 an animation of them signing off. Yes, yeah, and I names. thought that was. That was fantastic because I think to to a person, 
every one of them has portrayed these characters uh, exceedingly well just on the pure mechanics of what the acting required of them. But also I thought they were fantastic custodians of the characters um, over the time that they inhabited them. And some of them may continue on. Most of them probably won't. Um, and, you know, you'd see them in interviews on talk shows uh, promoting, you know, some serious Oscar caliber work that they had just been in. But of course the, the host, all they want to talk about is, you know, the latest Avengers that's filming or about to film and whatever. And I never sensed any, any sort of uh, fatigue with them. There was always enthusiasm, and and I I I think we're all uh, very uh, fortunate to have had this group of people do this. And when I saw the movie the second time I saw it, there was this um, middle aged to elderly woman standing in the behind the last row of the of the auditorium, and she was just standing there with rapt attention looking as those names come came by. And when Robert Downey Jr.'s name came by, she just applauded you know, <laughs> so much. And I, I talk with my comic book geek friends about how, you know, how appealing these stories are now to what, you know, I would call the civilians out there. You know, like 95% of the audience for these movies is not these, you know, the people who cherished these stories to begin with. Right. And it's just amazing to see that. Yeah, um... Like I said, if you had told me when I was 11 years old and reading comic books that, like, these you know, that there would be movies of my beloved characters and they would be the most popular things in the world, <laughs> in, like, like, world cinema, I, like, no way would I have believed you. Um, although I was, I was more into X-Men than I was into, like, the Avengers <laughs> stuff as a kid. Um, but, yeah, so it's, I, yeah, so I guess what, I don't have anything else to say about, about Endgame except, um, pretty good and they brought it in <laughs> like um they did a good job uh you know it, but if looking at the whole sequence of 20 odd movies it really is like I, I it's incomparable in terms of cinema i guess maybe some things on tv like i said or literature compared to it um and just that there's so many of them and almost all of them are at least pretty good um there's only yeah. a couple stinkers and yeah just like you know robert downey jr has been playing this character for like a dozen years at this point. Um, so the fact that he wanted to die and <laughs> go do something else with his life uh, totally made sense. But when is the last, when is the last time you saw the first Iron Man by any chance? I don't know if I ever rewatched it after seeing it the first time, honestly, but I never liked I, it a lot. I just rewatched it uh, the week before and I had not seen it for several years. And Iron Man just happens to be my pretty much my favorite Marvel character, and that was that was a rare thing back in my generation. Like nobody was an Iron Man fan, <laughs> but um, which is kind of weird. Uh, but um, he uh, he pulls out this smartphone in in one of the early scenes that's supposed to wow you with this technology. And I remember in the theater thinking it was pretty cool, <laughs> but it was just this like thing with buttons on it, and it was sort of like a sidekick, and it like pops out with this like little fly, you know, two inch video screen and it just seems so utterly quaint right now it's ridiculous yeah that's funny because the movies because 2008 was i think the year that the iphone came out um and yeah it was also the year that uh that the marvel cinematic universe was launched um so yeah so the fact that they made all these movies that they tie together that they're mostly pretty good that they kind of tell a semi-coherent story um and that, like, yeah, there was never a point where you're just like, you know, screw this, I don't want to deal with this shit anymore. I mean, maybe, I mean, you know, some people, lots of people complain about how there are too many uh, comic book movies, but, yeah. um, you know, these are, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's just, it is a, a crazy achievement, and um, I, do, I don't know, I don't think it can be topped, but of course, yeah, Disney owns Marvel now, and they want to keep on making money, so <laughs> it's unclear in what direction this is going to go. There are, of course, going to, there's going to be another Black Panther, and I'm sure another um, Captain Marvel, and, like, they want to keep on pumping these things out because they always make a lot of money. But to do this, you know, the thing about, like, Avengers, the comic book has been going since 1963, and, uh, you know, Captain America is still going strong, um, but they're going to do something different <laughs> because Chris Evans doesn't want to do it anymore. So rebooting with a new actor is, you know, the obvious thing. And they did that with Spider-Man already. 
Um, but, or, I mean, I mean, a more interesting thing to do would be like, okay, uh, you know, the original Avengers were a bunch of white people and now we have seemingly a black, uh, Captain America and, uh, Captain Marvel is a woman and possibly a lesbian. I don't know. And, you know, Black Panther, uh, joining the team would of course make sense. So, so doing it like the second iteration of, you know, who these, who these characters are, but they're a more diverse set of actors and like more, a more varied set of stories would be, would be yeah. one interesting path. Yeah. As much as they have mined the Marvel universe thus far, uh, I'm here to tell you there's still stuff there. They, uh, some of my best comic friends were texting me immediately after they saw it. Like, all right, who do you want for the big bad next time around? You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's and, a, there's a, yeah, there's an incredible cornucopia of characters and storylines um, and if they they, if they bring the mutants in and they bring Fantastic Four in, now that Disney owns those properties, they could bring in some new blood there. I don't know if audiences are tired of the X stories or that. I hope not, but we'll see. Yeah, and um, I guess the you know uh, my la- final thought is if you <clears throat> if you compare what what Marvel has done since around the year two thousand with movies with what DC has done. Uh, in the same two decade time span, like you really see that like Marvel has <laughs> blown DC out of the water. There are some very good, you know, Wonder Woman is very good. Some of the Batman movies are very good. And there's a lot of ones I didn't see because I'm not a huge DC fan and they got bad reviews, but um, it showed that this was not like some automatic moneymaker, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, like LeBron James kind of like, you know, it's, it's going to be great kind of thing. Um, they could yeah. have screwed it up, and DC has kind of screwed it up, and, but like Marvel did not screw it up. So, <laughs> agree. <agreed. laughs> um, okay. Anything else? So, do you want to? Um, where do you want to? Do you want to say first of all anything else before we say our goodbyes? We've been talking uh, for about no, no, an hour I, I, fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think we've covered it well. Okay. Well, um, so thank you, Milton, for coming back on uh, Blogging Heads. Um, work. So, so. Where can people find your comics work? Uh, you can find most of my stuff either on my Twitter feed, at Citizen Milton, or on my website, MiltonLawson.com. Uh, I was just a participant or a contributor to a uh, anthology campaign that just uh, finished on Kickstarter, uh, I think like a month or so ago, maybe two months, I'm losing track of time, called uh, Roads Not Traveled. It's a collection of short stories about road trips with famous people, either living or dead or imaginary fictional. And my contribution to that collection is a short story titled Roger Ebert and Me, in which I go through a magical road trip through the world of movies with the legendary film critic Roger Ebert. Um, And uh, I have a number of comics projects that are very close to announcing but I can't announce yet, so stay tuned to Citizen Milton on Twitter. Okay, cool. And you, I know you work in the non-superhero genres of comics, which, you know, there are many. Um, but do you ever do I, superhero stuff? Or, or not? I, I'm part of a workshop um, that gives you exercises. And one of the exercises was something that either lent itself well to superhero storytelling or, or maybe it was explicitly done. And I had a newfound respect for the superhero genre after <laughs> trying my hand at it for the first time. Hmm. It's very, very difficult. Um, there are a number of characters, of course, that in the, in the canon of the, the big two that were I ever so fortunate as to uh, get an opportunity to work on them, I, I, I would relish the opportunity. But the majority of my work is either science fiction or slice of life type stuff. Cool. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, when I had a you know, just as a kid, I had a brief period where I was like, had an idea for a comic book, um, and started like working out with a friend, and you know, neither of us could draw. That was a problem, <laughs> and I don't know if we got past uh, one page. But I still think you know, it was. I still think it's a pretty good idea. Maybe we could t- <laughs> maybe I'll tell you it offline. But it's probably been done already. Okay. Anyway, um, so uh, okay, so you are Citizen Milton on Twitter. I am R E A C W on Twitter. Uh, so thank you, Milton, for coming on and talking about Avengers Endgame. Thanks to anyone who listened to all of this, because we've gone <laughs> on for a while. And uh, if somehow you've listened to all this and haven't seen Avengers Endgame yet, uh, I would say go see it anyway, because, you know, 
get to see all these beautiful people jumping around and all the special effects and stuff. And, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's worth seeing. Okay. So, um, thank you, Milton. And thanks to our viewers and listeners. We'll see you again next time.